All right, good day everyone. It's CJ from Rogue 420, and I am very excited today to be joined by Dr. Michelle Ross. Uh, Dr. Michelle Ross is a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, she is also an expert in health benefits of medical cannabis. She is an author and founder of Impact Network, which is a 501c nonprofit, and their focus is improving marijuana policy accelerating cannabinoid therapeutics for women worldwide uh, i've waited a long time for this interview i'm very excited i've i've followed michelle's work for almost a year now and very excited to have her so michelle welcome to rogue 420 well thank you so much for having me i can't wait i love educating uh people especially women on the miraculous benefits of cannabis um and i can't wait to share my story and uh, how you can help uh, women just by sharing some of this knowledge that I'm dropping today. So, Yeah, excellent. And, it, and it's a perfect time because if we look at all the implications of health, if we take a look at how traditional medicine has, for the most part, really failed, uh, you know, women and men on a significant uh, factor as far as the different medicines, cannabis can play a, a very instrument, instrumental role in that. One of the first things I always get started whenever I interview is Michelle is talking about the history and I'm, it always intrigues intrigues me on how someone gets started with medical cannabis so share with our listeners how you got started with medical cannabis sure so i was actually a researcher before i was a patient um so i actually was funded by the national institute on drug abuse to study the effects of um potentially harmful or illicit drugs of abuse like cocaine heroin methamphetamine and cannabis. Of course, we didn't call it cannabis. We called it marijuana because <laughs> that's, of course, a slang derogatory criminal term for it. Um, but I actually was in a lab looking at um, the effects of uh, prescriptions and illegal drugs on brain development. And we had an area of the brain called the hippocampus. That's your learning and memory center. It's also a center that's involved with risk for drug addiction. And so you actually grow new brain cells in this area. And uh, you don't really grow any new brain cells anywhere else. Uh, so it's a really cool mechanism. And people were talking about it for um, it, how it might be um, involved in uh, depression or in substance abuse risk. Um, and I actually, my very first paper in 2006 was looking at um, the effects of different cannabinoids and adult neurogenesis, again, that, that brain cell growth. And it's sort of interesting because I wasn't a marijuana user. I didn't really know any marijuana patients. I grew up in Jersey. I was going to school in uh, Dallas, Texas, which, by the way, um, if you were to somehow stumble upon uh, marijuana, it was not the medical type. It was like Mexican brickweed that you should not be smoking. <laughs> so no one had any, even in graduate school, which is sort of hilarious. <laughs> right. um, so I had really no, you know, um, I really had no background in actually using it or knowing um, cannabis users outside of like what would be typical, like, like the criminals or like the stereotypical people that that we now know are not really <laughs> representative of cannabis users. And so I published on it and we actually looked at all the data and it suggested that cannabinoids can stimulate uh brain growth and neurogenesis, which is opposite of every other illegal drug on earth. Um, so, well, except for psychedelics, which we know now shouldn't be illegal drugs. They're probably very helpful and beneficial and groups like MAPS are studying them right now for brain health. So, uh, so my very first paper was cannabis and I, I was not, you know, I wasn't led to that, you know, it just happened in my lab. And then, um, much like all the other clinicians and scientists, I wasn't taught about the endocannabinoid system. I actually helped write a book on pharmacology. And, you know, there's like three three pages on the endocannabinoid system in there. So a lot of the stuff I had to learn, I had to teach myself. Um, and I kept teaching myself over the years, even though I went on to study other things like cocaine and heroin because they did cause brain damage. Um, and my lab was it had to be funded, so you couldn't keep studying things that uh, didn't cause brain damage because the government doesn't fund that work. So anyway, so I kept t teaching myself about things and uh, one thing led to another. And um, I ended up uh, meeting my husband, Todd, uh, who had actually been in the cannabis industry for years. And he's like, you need to take all this knowledge that you have and apply it to helping patients. So he had been involved as a grower, um, involved in um, 
uh, dispensaries uh, throughout um, California. So it was just like, okay, here's somebody who, who knows the patients. And here I am, you know, my little academic castle, like I know how it works, like in theory, and it's like, let's combine this and actually help people. So we founded the endocannabinoid deficiency foundation in 2013. And that's actually what we now call impact network, we had to change the name because uh, the government doesn't like to send grants or other nonprofits are really leery when you say cannabis or cannabinoid in the title. Thanks. Right work either so uh <laughs> so network impact network you know um which uh it's i love it because we're able to say we make an impact on cannabis and when that's a lot of our hashtags are impact cannabis or impact breast cancer or impact uh lupus whatever the condition is that we're trying to make a com- campaign around and do research for uh, we're able to use that so it's a little fun so so we're uh, making a big impact in the world that that's a great story and and very interesting. I always find it's it's interesting to hear different backgrounds, how people got started, uh, and then also more importantly, if you take a look nationally at uh, cannabis and you take a look at the the states that have legalized with the advocacy, and then more important, we're seeing a whole new group of people the the actual people that believe that medical cannabis its utilization people wanting to learn more one of the questions that i always get asked and and i see a lot of questions posted on social media is people want to know more about the endocannabinoid system and the receptors can you explain for our listeners what is that <laughs> well you know i do have a cannabis 101 talk and it does last an hour so i'll try to like be brief it's really <laughs> I'm so excited about it but i'm actually wearing a uh, visual tool for this so um, so the endocannabinoid system is basically your built-in uh, neurotransmitter system for accepting your own body's natural marijuana substances, as well as in de- uh, exogenous or plant-based uh, cannabinoids um, like THC found in marijuana. Um, so um, the two main endocannabinoids that your body makes are called anandamide. Um, that's often thought of as the bliss molecule, um, because Ananda means bliss in Sanskrit. Um, You also have another endocannabinoid called 2-AG, which is a lot less sexy and a lot less studied. (laughs) So um, what's cool about the endocannabinoid system is actually your your largest neurotransmitter system. So neurotransmitters, for people that don't know, um, refer to the message that's uh, basically chemically um, travels between uh, two brain cells. So this is how your neurons, your brain cells talk to each other. So they send little chemical messages and basically it's like a a game of telephone. Um, So you have a dopamine system that regulates pleasure. You have serotonin that regulates feeding and fighting and that other F word uh, we like to call mating in the the science world. So you have all these different neurotransmitter systems, but the cool thing is that the endocannabinoid system actually regulates all of them. So these regular neurotransmitters, you know, are regular messages, but it's sort of like when you're changing the radio station, you're like, okay, you know, let's get to this station. Um, The endocannabinoid system is, is the fine dial. So once you're already set on, okay, um, this is what we're, what messages we're sending out. The endocannabinoid system's like, okay, let's just make sure it's at the optimal frequency so that we can hear that music playing loud and clear, crystal clear. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of us have an unhealthy endocannabinoid system. That's why we feel like crap. And that's also why um, cannabis is so helpful for so many different conditions. Because if you are activating the system that regulates everything, it doesn't matter whether you're depressed and your serotonin system is off or you're not eating right because you have anorexia and you have something wrong, say with your dopamine receptors or something else, cannabis can help because it's going to figure out what's wrong in your body and fix that fine tune. Um, So that's really exciting. The one thing I didn't talk about was actually uh, your receptors. And so neurotransmitters are sort of like the keys and your, uh, your receptors are the locks. And so you need a, the right key to fit in the right lock. And then you open the door and some kind of physiological process happens afterwards, whether that's learning something, remembering something, moving, you know, whatever, all those things that our body does, right? So um, the key is that your endocannabinoids or your plant cannabinoids and your lock is your cannabinoid receptors. And so we call those CB1 or CB2 receptors. Those can be found in your body and in your brain. 
Um, the CB1 receptors are actually what's responsible for that high feeling we get when THC is the key. So THC plus a CB1 receptor equals I feel high. Um, you also have CB2 receptors. Your CB2 receptors are found on immune cells. Um, they're also a little bit found in the brain. But when THC combines with a CB2 receptor, it doesn't make you high. What it does is it relieves pain and inflammation and a whole bunch of other things that are very complicated. So I won't go into all that. <laughs> No, that's, you know, a, that's a great explanation, and I think that that's the biggest key because you see a lot of people ask, well, how can cannabis, cannabis be used for so many different everything. health conditions? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like everything, and that's what's truly amazing about this natural plant. I was listening to one of your other interviews, and some, you said something very interesting. And when we think primarily regarding health, good health, I know I need to lose some weight myself. I'm going to focus on that. But needless to say that we talk a lot about uh, whenever something does happen, right, the, the reactive approach. But you also talked about utilizing cannabis for preventive health conditions as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. And in fact, I actually just recorded a lesson on that, um, Cannabis as Preventative Medicine with Greenflower Media, which is an amazing place if you want more information about cannabis, um, either to use it yourself or to help others. Um, but very few people talk about this. And um, we don't really talk about preventative medicine in general right now, um, because the, the medicine, the sorry, the um, the profits in medicine don't come from preventing disease. They come from treating it. They right, want exactly. customers, right? Exactly. So if we can prevent you having cancer, then we can't charge you for all the chemotherapy and all the other after visits and scans and all this other stuff. But um, I do think that there is so much potential, obviously, for using cannabis as a treatment. But imagine if you could actually do something like prevent your cancer cells from growing into a detectable tumor. And this is what I have to say is that each and every one of us, I'm sitting here with cancer, you're sitting there with cancer, and this is because cancer is just a cell with mutated DNA. And so we all have a bunch of cancer cells. Normally our system, um, our immune system will actually go and target them and kill them or you know, some of them will grow and you know, maybe they'll be knocked out along the way. But in some of us, and many of us, in fact, one in two men and over two in five women in Colorado will get cancer. And the, the statistics are very similar throughout the United States. We will all get some form of cancer. Um, and so all that means is that those cells are now growing. If we could just freeze them right now so that it doesn't cause any problems, it doesn't travel to our brain, it doesn't travel to our lymphatic system, then we live pretty much till, you know, the end of our life where, you know, where we get some kind of other disease or syndrome. But like, I actually think that we could harness the power of cannabinoids to prevent cancer. I mean, I, I see a world without cancer in 50 years once we're all on the same page about how to use this plant. It's revolutionary. It's crazy because we assume that cancer is part of life. It does not need to be. And that, to me, is the most exciting thing on Earth. And I, I spread that gospel all over the place. Raw cannabinoids are where it's at because the raw cannabinoids, and that's the cannabinoid before you heat it up, so like CBD or THC before it's decarboxylated, is actually more powerful as a preventative medicine than the heated version. So THCA, for example, is more powerful at preventing the spread of cancer than THC is. Um, but that's a whole new field that we know very little about. Um, but our group is actually working to help track uh, cancer treatment and cancer survivorship because we have more people than ever surviving cancer. Yes, <laughs> good thing, but cancer comes back. So right, it does. And, you know, cancer is one of those things, I think, for most part, when you talk to a lot of families, either either directly or someone within the family. And, and that's what's so exciting about cannabis. And if we can, if we could unschedule cannabis so that we can conduct more of these <laughs> clinical studies, more of these, and, and I think that that momentum is really happening. I think people are, I think there's an awakening that's occurring. I think it started with the opioid addiction that's gripping our country right now. And the use of all these pharmaceutical drugs where there's this natural plant cannabis that can help and what you just said those last two minutes regarding preventive health and understanding what cancer cells are and how they work is just so important and unfortunately a lot of people just don't know that so so I'm excited that you did state that now let's say for example that someone is new someone wants to get in to medical cannabis as far as you know utilizing it themselves granted their state is legal <laughs> um, yep. what what advice do you provide how how does someone get started in medic with medical cannabis 
Sure. Um, so that's not an easy question to answer, of course, because each and every one of uh, the states has their own set of laws, right? And so you, you could be, say, a fibromyalgia patient in one state and not be able to access it legally through the medical program. So there's also recreational cannabis, which means anyone over that, say, the age of 21 can use it in some states like Colorado and uh, eventually California next year. Um, so there's the, the first thing I tell people is to check your laws. Um, so you obviously don't want to do anything that might jeopardize uh, your livelihood, uh, first off. Um, if you happen to be in a state where you can't access the medical program for some reason, um, I would suggest, you know, look into CBD. Uh, that's a great thing that is available in all 50 states. You just have to be able to find a, a valid and reputable um, company that's making it. Um, so it's, it's tested and safe and you're not buying, say, uh, <laughs> phony snake oil type of stuff. Right, um, right. Right. Yeah, right. that is a concern still because it's an unregulated industry, right? Sure. But you can also buy crappy vitamins that are, don't say what they don't have what they say on the label either. So it's up to you as a consumer to be educated. But um, in terms of when we're talking about cannabis, right? Um, so most patients obviously get cannabis um, through the dispensary system. Some states do have caregivers and things like that, but. I always suggest that patients, you know, go low um, and they, they start slow. So don't go in there and say, have your first experience be with a hundred milligram THC edible. You're going to have a miserable experience. You might even think that cannabis is like the worst thing on earth. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, that was my first experience. Okay. I did not use cannabis again for like five more years. I was just like, oh my God, I'm crazy. Like I'm one of those people that can't use cannabis. So, like I was in Disneyland hiding under a park bench, like thinking that like people in costumes were out to get me. <laughs> Right. The story. I, if you had asked Michelle from back then if she was leading a nonprofit institute, never. I would have never. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> you know. Um, but but things are funny, right? Um, so, um, a lot of patients, if they have their first experience be a negative one with cannabis, they may not ever go back to it. So, um, we have to frame it in a way where you're going to have the most positive experience. Um, possible. For some uh, patients, that also means um, consuming in a quiet place, um, as opposed to say, a party or when they're drinking or some kind of social thing that can cause either paranoia or anxiety their first time. Um, so do it with people that you either trust in a, in a safe um, and welcoming environment. Also, um, drink water, all those kind of things, you know, you have there's certain things that you need to do with first time. But when you're talking about finding the perfect dose, for you, right? And you're like, okay, we're over our first time or we're over just trying to use it recreationally. I want to use this to help relieve my pain or I want to use this to relieve my nausea. I suggest everyone use a journal because you're not going to find within the first a strain that you say smoke is probably not going to be the magical strain for you that relieves your migraines or is great for your back or whatever it is that you're looking for. And in fact, you might actually need a couple of tools in the toolbox. You might need a daytime uh, cannabis strain you smoke. You might need a nighttime one or a nighttime edible. You might need one for that time of the month. That's a completely different strain, right? Um, so keep track of what works for you, what doesn't. And, and it's okay that what works for you may not be the same as somebody else with the same condition or the same problem as you. We're all different. We're all special. And there's like that magical strain that just is that f perfect key for us. And so uh, you may not know it. You, it may even take you a year, for example, because there are so many strains. I mean, there are like hundreds of strains out there and hundreds of different products. But, um, you know, just keep tracking and seeing, you know, if you can find that perfect fit. It's almost like dating, honestly. Right. <laughs> you're you're well. right. Yes. Well. yes. <laughs> but uh, once you find that one, you're just like, oh, where have you been my whole life? <laughs> and, it, and it always seems like... And no matter what state that you're in, you always hear the story of somebody that visited Colorado and did an <laughs> edible for the first time. I think everyone has that same story. Well, it was only a small chocolate bar. I, you know, I ate half of it. And I didn't know, so I went ahead and had another two and then had that, that, that happen. So, yes, that's very important. Now, I know that you bring a lot of passion to your work. Uh, you're involved a, a lot in with the education part of it, with the advocacy. I want to make sure I give you ample time to talk about you know, what's on your radar, what's important to you right now, so that our listeners uh, know. So I just want to open the floor to you, yield the floor to you to talk about uh, what you'd like to share with our listeners. Sure. So um, I've actually been traveling quite a lot lately. And it's really nice sometimes to get outside of the 
cannabis box um, to see um, what's important around the country. Um, and of course, um, being involved with advocacy, it's really important because I'm in a state where cannabis is legal recreationally and um, uh, uh, on the medicinal market too. And so it's really easy to become complacent when you're in a place where it's legal. Well, it's, it's legal for me, so the work is done. But when I see the magic and the amazing health benefits we've had for patients, no matter what their condition is, it's so important that we open up um, more qualifying conditions for cannabis. For example, in Colorado, we hadn't added another medical qualifying condition, I don't know, eight, eight, eight ten years, and we finally were able to advocate and add uh, post post traumatic stress disorder or PTSD awesome. mm -hmm. qualifying yep, conditions. So, so we have to keep adding qualifying conditions in states where it's. Um, is legal, but it's not accessible to everyone. We also have to still fight for every single state to have access. It's not right that a cancer patient um, who has their medicine legal in Colorado, the second they cross a state border, could be um, arrested and put in jail. So I want to impress on everyone how important it is to not be complacent. If, if it's available for you, we have to think about um, access uh, for everyone in every state and also to groups that might not be able to have it. Like for example, I work with pregnant moms and uh, in Colorado, if your baby comes up positive for THC, you're going to have to fight for custody for your child. Oh wow. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and the heartbreaking part of this is we're talking about harm reduction. So say you're, say you're a pain patient like me, um, and this is me before for, uh, cannabis. I'm, on, I'm not on any pharmaceuticals now, but before I was on uh, Oxy, like I was on MS Conin, like I was on all these antidepressants, like all the, all the like a whole big pharmacy. And all these drugs are not healthy for your baby. But what happens if you have an unplanned pregnancy, but you're still in pain? I mean, you can't just go off all your pharma. So um, there are mothers that are choosing right now to make the safer choice and go off their pharmaceuticals and onto cannabis while they're pregnant and help prevent some of the brain damage that's uh, associated with using opiates uh, during uh, pregnancy. And instead, they're getting knocked when they have their baby. <laughs> they, this, the system would rather have their baby be positive for their legal prescription for opiates than to be on cannabis. Even CBD is an issue in some states. There was a mom that was breastfeeding and she had epilepsy. She was taking CBD for her epilepsy, and then somehow her her baby got tested or something, and it was um, considered to be child abuse. Um, and that's just absurd to me. So it's very important that we continue to work on policies that protect mothers uh, in particularly, because my institute works um, with cannabis and women's health. It doesn't matter if I tell you that cannabis is the right choice if accessing it means you're going to lose your job or lose your child. I mean, how could you... You're, you as a mom is always going to make the choice of, I would rather be in pain and, and like, you know, hurt myself than risk losing my own child. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's the cases where we're seeing people fight for custody. They chose cannabis and now they're losing their children. And that's not right. So right. Yeah, just, that's, that's, that, that is, that's terribly heartbreaking. And in part, especially when you see some of the most severe cases with uh, some of the families that have their kids with severe autism. And yeah. I have seen firsthand experience where uh, a kid is, is self-harming, self-injury, and the moment they are given, you know, a, a, you know a vaporizer using, you know, cannabis, within, you know, just a few minutes, their behavior, they the, the self-harming stops and everything. So you're, you're right. That's one aspect of it. It's just so important. Let's, let's end this whole medical a refugee that people have to move their entire families uh, to seek the basic treatment of, of, of being healthy, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and, and on that note, I'm glad that you actually brought up autism because that can be a condition where the caretakers, the, the mothers and the fathers of a child that had autism or a teenager that had autism, right? Because there's such violence involved, um, unfortunately. Um, these parents can develop PTSD. And so we talk about, you know, cannabis is okay to treat, you know, um, patients or like the autistic children, but we also need to think about stress management and, and mental health of caregivers, right? And so um, when mom is so stressed out and actually develops PTSD from the relationship with her child, it's okay for her to use cannabis. But a lot of times the mothers will be like, no, it's only for my sick kid, it's not for me. And I just wanna impart that it's okay to take care of you too. Cannabis is for everyone. You can use it responsibly and be an amazing parent. And in fact, it may be able to help you reconnect with your child that's actually causing you trauma. And like, you can't even, 
you know, be an involved parent when you're scared of being hurt. So right. it's something that I've seen has actually helped mothers when they finally let go and let get, go of the guilt and shame associated with using cannabis for themselves. You're a sick patient too, unfortunately. I mean, dealing anytime you have the stress of dealing with a either terminally ill or very chronically ill um, loved one, it can really hurt your mental and physical health. So it's okay to use cannabis too. So. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. And Uh, I'm glad you added that because, you know, one of the things that the interesting statistics in regards to PTSD is with our our veterans and we're seeing our veterans that are not having access to medical cannabis. And it's just amazing to take a look at the um, the very unfortunate situation regarding suicide rate with our veterans and Mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, with medical uh, cannabis, then getting the qualifying condition for PTSD, it could truly change that. So uh, anyway, don't want to interrupt you. Uh, what else would you like to share? <laughs> sure. Um, so October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I do want to share that we have an up-and-coming uh, pilot program uh, for breast cancer patients. Um, so um, you can uh, hit us up at help at impactcannabis.org uh, for more information. If you're a current um a breast cancer patient or breast cancer survivor that would like some more um, guidance on how to use cannabis uh, for your cancer or uh, be able to prevent recurrence of that cancer. And so um, we are actually uh, a qualified research team. Uh, We're registered with the NIH as a research institute and we're collecting that data um, in conjunction uh, with uh, several groups here in Colorado, but you don't have to be in Colorado to be part of it. But the whole point of what we're doing is that we are partnered with the Colorado Cancer Coalition to identify whether cancer um, is actually improved by cannabis use. And isn't it crazy that we don't know whether in states where cannabis has been legalized, whether people live longer with breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, you know, any type of cancer, we don't have that data. We have the data. Yeah. So we have the data that suggests, you know, when you legalize cannabis, you have less DUIs or you have less opiate deaths, but we really don't know about specific cancers and whether legalizing cannabis is a good thing. I mean, we all know, but we don't have the numbers to actually convincingly tell legislators. And what's nice is that once we understand how how cannabis or CBD use helps. Um, we can then provide it in treatment guidelines for doctors. Um, we can provide a rationale for doing more clinical research. Um, but we have the opportunity to get a lot of data fast using technology platforms. So instead of doing a clinical trial that costs $2 million, $2 million and may or may not work, I mean, there was a cancer trial, for example, um, funded by GW Pharma. And they looked at their like one-to-one Sativex spray in cancer pain, and it came out with it, like the results are so weak, it doesn't really show a benefit. Yet we know that cancer patients are using cannabis every day for their cancer pain. I mean, no matter what form it is, if they're using dabs, who cares? It's better than taking, you know, like piles of Oxycontin, you know, for your pain or fentanyl. Um, we know that at cannabis can be utilized responsibly by cancer patients for their pain without turning them into opiate addicts. And that's also another dirty thing. Like you may treat your, your cancer, right? But you might be addicted to opiates for the rest of your life. I mean, like that's, that's a scary thing that we don't even talk about. You know, it's like a cancer patient, once they survive, has a whole bunch of problems related to their chemotherapy treatment and pharmaceutical treatment. And you know, it's when, with 92% of, say, breast cancer patients surviving, I mean, it's very real that we all know cancer survivors, and yet they have pain, they have nerve pain, they have skin issues, they have mental health issues, fatigue. I mean, being a cancer survivor doesn't mean it's a walk in the park. Yes, you survive, but you still are fighting a chronic illness. So sure. we really have to understand how we can harness the power of cannabis to not only treat cancer, to help cancer survivors and to prevent cancer in the first place. So that's what we're doing. So if you go to impactcannabis.org, you can fill out either the, the contact form, you can hit us up at help at impactcannabis.org. Um, or if you want to support our efforts, um, you can always donate impactcannabis.org slash donate um, because we need your funding. Unfortunately, clinical research is not funded uh for the benefits of medical cannabis. Um, if you want to look at cannabis addiction or some other horrible thing, um, they'll gladly fund it. But the second you want to say we're going to prevent uh, deaths in this country through cannabis, they will not be funding that. So our work is really cutting edge and unifying several mainstream groups, including our healthcare systems. So we really want the opportunity to knock down all the um, obstacles to legalizing cannabis, not only through the United States, but through the world. Cannabis 
should be a first line treatment for cancer, not the treatment of last resort. That's so true. Well said. Very well said. And how can our listeners learn more about you? How can they follow your work? If you want to plug your uh, website, your so- social handles, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so you can follow me at Dr. Michelle Ross, um, and that's D R M I C H E L E R O S S. I'm missing one L in my Michelle. <laughs> so, um, but you can find me on that on Twitter or on Instagram. You can always tweet me a, a question about uh, cannabis on there. I'll try to respond and. and two tweets or less. Um, and if you have, of course, a private uh, health question, you know, that's best, um, answered, uh, by emailing us at help at impactcannabis.org. Um, you can also find me at my website, uh, drmichelleross.com, um, where, um, I have information about speaking engagements in case your group wants to, um, have us be able to speak about cannabis, um, for whatever condition, because we have over 15 topics we've, we've spoken on, um, and we also provide consulting. Again, it's going to be made easier and we're going to be able to help more patients through our technology platform because it's really hard when you're doing one-on-one coaching to be able to handle more than a couple hundred patients uh, you know, yearly. So we're really hoping to provide that support for everyone. Um, and then finally, I have this cute little THC necklace here. Let's show you here. Cool. Um, so um, for a $20 donation, um, we send uh, the necklace out. So 100% of the proceeds go to our 501c3. So thank you. <laughs> and oh, you can no, find absolutely. the Dr. Michelle Ross. Awesome. And I will make sure uh, for listeners, I will put uh, the description, the website, the links in the show notes as well. So that way, make it easier to navigate for listeners. So, uh, Dr. Michelle Ross, I want to thank you so much for being with Rogue 420. Um, I'm very excited about the work that you're doing. We cannot thank you enough. It's just so important in today's day of age of, of medicine that uh, more people get involved, they, they learn, and then also exactly what you said for those states that are not legal, the advocacy portion of it, um, and the tremendous amount of help as far as preventive medicine that cannabis can provide. So uh, this is CJ, everyone, delivering another Rogue 420 interview. Uh, very excited to get this posted. And I again, I will post all the notes with links uh, for the show notes. So everyone take care. Bye. Thanks, CJ. <laughs>